Well, hey everyone, it's Hudson. This is my Z8 setup video. It's gonna be a little long. We're gonna go through the menus with quite a bit of granular detail. And I'm gonna show you how I set them up and how I use the, the, the shooting banks and the custom settings banks to make this camera and the Z9 that I've been shooting with for the last year into essentially four different cameras, for four different purposes with just a couple of touches of the screen in the I menu. Uh, and I'll also show you how I set it up so that when you're in your kind of everyday knock around mode or in a landscape mode with say slow shutter speed and no auto ISO and uh, a single, you know, a single point autofocus point, you can just touch a button, suddenly be in action shooting mode, ready to photograph that eagle that's swooping towards you over the horizon. You know, th there's some, there's some cool features that the Z9 brought. And of course this is, the Z9 embodied in a smaller body, few less programmable control buttons and no built-in grip, uh, but it's got the same capabilities, really for the first time in a smaller camera, all the capabilities essentially of the big brother pro build dual gripped Top Gun Nikon camera. So we'll go through, I'll show you how to use it and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to think about these banks. They're different than the user modes that we had on the mode dial in other cameras in the past. They're more of a bookmark type system that you have to be really careful about preserving. Um, we'll go into that. I'll show you a few settings I think definitely you should change from stock and I'll just show you how, how I have my camera set up. Um, this is not a review video. I'm doing a full review video that's posting at the same time as this. You can click this link here to hear what I think about in comparison uh, with my Z9 that I've just been loving for the last year and the Z6 II and Z7 II and Z6 and Z7 and Z50 that I've shot, uh, as well as the old DSLRs that I used for decades before that. Um, there's also links in this video's description. If you click, there's a table of contents with all the different parts of this video, the different menus, the different highlights. You can click on the time code and go right to that part of this video if you wanna go back and re-reference something or you're more interested in one part than another and you wanna skip ahead. There's also a chaptered out table of contents basically on the timeline of this video you can click into to get to the part that you're interested in. Uh, I also put links to all of the, you know, to my website where I have links to all the gear that I use and recommend alongside backpacks and filters and custom built tripods and that's always available right here or over at hudsonhenry.com slash ATS links and I really really appreciate all of you clicking those links they help me out so um, and I'll probably put a couple other videos I have a video all about using shooting banks in the Z9 and backing them up that I think is valuable for anybody just stepping into a Z8 I'll talk about it briefly but if you want a video completely about that once again just click here or in this video's title and show more and alongside that chapter dot table of contents, you'll find all of those links. All right, so <clears throat> a couple things I think you should change for sure off the get-go with this camera. I think you should change the, the sensor shield behavior at, at, at shutdown. That's in the setup menu. We'll get into it when I go through the menus, but you should set it so that when you turn the camera off, that little thing that looks like a shutter closes in front of the sensor and keeps dust and dirt and debris and crap from getting on your sensor. Um, you need to to be able to deactivate that, to clean it, to blow it out and clean it, but you aren't gonna need to clean it as much if you turn it on in the first place, and I don't know why it's not turned on by default. I think that turning on back button autofocus is something you should always do, and we'll talk about that when I get to that setting. Um, I think that you should turn on the high frame per second viewfinder frame rate. Even though it eats a little extra battery, it's worth it, uh, in my opinion. We'll talk about that. Uh, and I think you should adjust your frame rates off of the stock setting so that the low continuous frame rates, 10 frames per second, and the high continuous is 20 frames per second. And, and avoid shooting in the 20 frames per second when you don't need it, because if you're at all like me, you're gonna find that you're just filling memory cards with thousands of images at 20 frames per second when you don't necessarily need to. We'll talk about that. All right, so. Brief, brief, brief discussion about the bank, something you need to know about what they are and how to back them up and how to preserve a backup of where you want your starting settings to be. You know, this is a complex camera with a lot of menu options. This video is gonna be long because of that. I'm gonna move as fast as I can and I'll be superficial with flash settings and, and video settings and some other things that I don't think are all that important, at least to me. Um, but you're gonna want to get a, 
a frame of reference, a starting point with this camera that you want all four of your shooting banks to be. For me, I have these shooting banks set as the standard setting bank. That's just my knock around everyday hand holding the camera, shooting people, animals, architecture, landscapes, whatever, handheld. And then I've got an action setting mode, which is for fast, erratic moving subject that's hard to get with my 3D tracking point. It's just hard to pick up like a fast moving bird in flight. My little 3D tracking point might be too small to find it. Um, and so I've got another setting in there with a hybrid autofocus function. And I'm gonna do a whole set of videos on how I set up these second, third, and fourth Mengi Bank setups for the action shooting for landscapes and for Astro. And that's clickable right here or linked in this video's full description once again. This video is long, those videos will be much shorter. They're just gonna take the standard settings, copy them into a new bank, and tweak them a little bit for action, tweak them a little bit for landscape, tweak them a little bit for Astro. Uh, but you wanna get those settings locked in space, but what I'm saying about these banks, there's two things to know about them. One, they only control certain menus. So the, the, the shooting menu bank is in the photo shooting menu and the video recording menu. No other menu stored in this bank. The custom settings bank controls only the things in the custom settings, you know, A through G here. That's it, doesn't control anything else. These menus, playback, setup, network, my menu, not stored in any bank at all. Those are locked in no matter what bank you happen to be in. So <clears throat> shooting and video recording are all in that shooting menu bank. Custom settings, all in the custom settings menu bank. I set all that stuff and other things that I want easy access to in my eye menu. You hit the little cursive eye button on the back of the camera and boom, there are all these and I can tap here and change which setting I'm in just that quick and easy. Um, along with a lot of other settings. I'll show you how to customize this and set that up because I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense as setup stock either. Um, then the, uh, the, the, the thing of it is though, these are not locked in stone like a user setting where you say save, save, save settings to user one, for example. This is very different. When you're in custom settings bank A, I've named it standard, you can rename these by going in here, you get a keyboard, you can type, you can copy them one to another. That's how we're gonna do that. Um, when you go into that and you're in settings bank A, any changes you make stay changed. You can go now into settings bank B and when you come back, it'll be right where you were when you last left settings bank A. So if you go tweaking all your settings that you like normally in bank A and then leave or turn the camera off and turn it back on or come back from another bank, it's still gonna be tweaked like it was the last time you were in that menu. It's literally a bookmark. Here's where I was last in this bank, which is, is tough. So there's a way around that, and I'll show you how to do it. It's, it's in the save and load menu settings, which I have stored in my menu. I'll show you how to store that in your my menu too. Uh, and, and, and you go in and you save your menu settings, and it saves those to your memory card. The sad thing is that if you format your memory card, it formats those settings as well. Um, it by default saves it to the Compact Flash Express B slot. If you take the Compact Flash Express B card out and put an SD card in and hit save, it'll save it to the, to the SD card. I recommend you save it to both cards. You save your settings. Once you have your settings the way you like them, save them to both of your memory cards and then have a cheap little 32 gigabyte old SD card that you save the menu settings to in a little SD card case in your bag as a backup. Maybe you have one at home and one in your bag, just in case you screw up and you format both memory cards. The key to not formatting your settings off of your card is before you go to format your card when you're done shooting, load your, memory, load your menu settings into the card or into the camera. So you've loaded your saved settings, then go in and format your memory card, then go back and save your menu settings back on. It's the only real method. Now, if you're in the field quick changing, for some reason, uh, you, can, you can just do delete all instead of format and then format later in the day after you offload stuff and you're getting ready for the next thing. You want your camera in its base settings. That's the only real way to have a set of base settings in this camera. And with its complexity and its power, you're gonna want a set of base settings that are your own and not the factory default. So that's my advice. Um, set up these banks, learn how to use them, save the settings to your memory card and be careful not to format them off. Just load the settings back onto your camera before you format, save them again after you format. It's like a three-step process. Load menu settings, format, save menu settings. I wish it was different. I know of some ways it could be different, but nobody consulted me on that, so.
It's an amazing camera. I, I love this camera in the Z9. If one thing I would change is that they would save it to internal memory and not make it a problem when you format your memory card. I'd also have one set of banks that's more, more banks that cover every menu in the camera. That would be great, but eh, you know, if wishes were horses, my grandpa always used to say. So let's jump in, let's start going through. So we're in photo shooting bank, we're in the shooting menu bank A and the photo shooting menu. The photo shooting menu and the video recording menu both are in bank A. So we're setting up our standard bank here that we will copy into other banks subsequently. So extended menu banks, all that means is it's gonna store the mode that you're in, manual, shutter priority, aperture priority, man, you know, uh, program mode, as well as shutter speed and aperture. I like that turned on. Storage folder, what folder is it in? Not a big deal. How you name the file, I have mine set up to be 0Z8 because I shoot with so many cameras, I just instantly wanna know where the file came from. Primary slot selection, definitely gonna be my CF Express B card. That's the fastest card known to still photography. Many times faster than the fastest SD card. Secondary slot function, that's that SD card slot. I know a lot of people like to back up, shoot to both cards. If you're shooting action in burst mode, it's gonna really limit how your buffer is gonna feel small because this camera is designed to write really, really fast to that CF Express B card. It's gonna slow you down trying to write at the same time to the SD card. It's gonna fill the buffer because it takes too long to write to the SD card. I personally never use backup. Um, I shoot overflow so that if I run out of room on the CF Express B card, it starts writing to the SD card and then I put all my video to the SD card so I know which was where and then I just back up everything at the end of the night. I have never had a CF Express B card fail me um, and I haven't really heard of them failing. They're really well built. It's not like SD cards, which are kind of flimsy. Um, image area, that's just whether you're full frame or DX crop. Tone mode, this is one I just urge you leave alone, leave it in standard dynamic range. This hyper log gamut mode they've added is kind of like video shooting logometric uh, tone curves in order to represent it on an HDR capable display. I think that technology is in flux. There's a lot of change yet to come in it. I think this might be jumping the shark a little bit. Um, if you're into that whole thing and you know more than I do, by all means, explore it. I'd say for everybody else, do like me and just leave it in SDR. Image quality, I like RAW. You can shoot RAW plus JPEG. There's a lot of different settings. I don't use these high efficiency RAW settings at all. Um, if I'm, if I'm going to shoot RAW, I shoot RAW in its lossless compression because that's the best quality I can shoot on this camera. Storage is cheap. I spend a lot of money on lenses and bodies and computers and storage and I don't want to limit this file's compatibility with editing software or limit its quality in any way, shape or form. So I don't even mess with the other compression. If there was, lot, if there was zero compression, I would choose that. Uh, and that's what I've done in the past with cameras that allowed it. So lossless compression, that's my choice. Um, ISO sensitivity settings, you know, I like to set the base at 64 when I'm in auto ISO. My auto ISO is turned on in my knockaround mode. You know, I kind of keep an eye on the ISO and adjust my shutter speed and aperture accordingly, but I let it save me from situations as I'm working in changing light. Um, and I set the maximum sensitivity up at 12,800. Um, it has great quality. I've gotten 12,800 images out of the Z9 in Costa Rican dark jungles with the 800 PF that look amazing when run through either DxO Pure Raw 3 or, or Lightroom's new denoise algorithm. It's just amazing what you can do now. And I let the minimum shutter speed float. The camera decides based on the lens I'm using. White balance, these are all your white balance settings. You've got a button on the top to change them to. That's, that's nothing new. Picture control, picture control is not applied to the RAW file. It's really only to the JPEG, but it's still important for a RAW photo shooter because it determines what the little image on the back of your monitor or in your LCD or in your viewfinder is gonna look like when you hit play. And it also determines what the, the, the histograms that you're looking at are rendered like. So if you choose vivid, it's really gonna going to add a whole bunch of saturation and contrast, and that's going to make it look like highlights and shadows are blown in the histogram that aren't really blown out. Um, I prefer neutral. Neutral has a nice looking image on the back of the camera. If you want to get really sticklery and really look like the raw file as much as possible, go flat. 
your images will look a little crummy on the back LCD. Neutral is a nice compromise between standard and flat for me. It's what I generally use. Um, manage picture control, that just lets you tweak the picture control settings, the various ones. This is also where you go if you want to shoot in monochrome. I shoot in monochrome a lot in the middle of the day. I love looking at the world through the viewfinder in black and white. Um, this is for if you're shooting in that hyperlog gamut HDR stuff. Again, avoid that, I think. Um, color space, this is where what, if you do shoot a JPEG, what color space is it saved in? Raw files don't have a color space. Your raw editor of choice is going to assign its own default color space as it interprets that data or demosaics it. Um, I choose Adobe RGB for my, for my JPEGs because I might want to edit them a little bit, and that's a wider color space that doesn't clip the colors as much. sRGB is more of a share on the web color space. <clears throat> Active D lighting, that just adds a little shadow detail. It's only applied in JPEGs. It's sort of computational photography stuff. Long exposure noise reduction, you can turn that on or off. I leave that in my eye menu so I can easily access it. Um, if you leave it on and you do long exposure, it's gonna take twice as much time to capture each frame. Um, I often turn this off to sort of range in on my composition and my focus for night shooting and then turn it on before I take the night shot. You can also really mess up low lit time lapses with long exposures because you're gonna have all these gaps while it does noise reduction. High ISO noise reduction, that's JPEG only again. I leave it at normal. Uh, vignette control, JPEG only. Diffraction compensation, JPEG only. I leave those sort of at default. Auto distortion control the same. Skin softening, this is some new kind of cool portrait stuff. I don't, you know, you could, you could, it's again JPEG. It can do some portraity kind of work on your JPEG file. I'm shooting raw, so it's really just not that important. Photo flicker reduction, that's for if you have lights that look like they're flickering and one image is darker and one image is brighter. It's gonna time your shooting, even in still shooting here, to, to, to be well lit, but it may introduce a little lag in the shutter press feel. High frequency is that same thing, but for LED lighting. Uh, metering, I'm almost always in, in matrix metering, but occasionally I use some spot metering. Um, flash control, that's for off-camera flash. When you have it set up and dialed in, you can control all your flashes and banks and everything like we used to. <clears throat> I use Godox for that stuff anymore, and I like to manually control my flashes. I do like to set it so that they come in at the end of a long exposure, so they're synced to the rear curtain. There's no real shutter, it's electronic, so it's a funny name, rear curtain, but at the end of the exposure, that's when the flash blasts in, if you're doing a long exposure. Um, I almost never do through the lens flash metering, but I put in quite a bit of compensation if I do. Um, focus mode, uh, autofocus continuous, is tracking a subject, continuing to constantly change the focus setting as the, fo as the subject moves closer or further away from you. Uh, so that's that tracking. In my general knock around mode, I, I, I have it in autofocus continuous and I have back button autofocus. If I want it to stop focusing, I just take my thumb off. And that's the beauty of back button autofocus. If, if, you, if you have it set in continuous autofocus, you can also have sort of single servo by focusing on a subject, taking your thumb off, and then you can recompose and shoot. If you're in, uh, if you have it on the shutter, it's going to refocus every time you try to take a picture. By just taking your thumb off, it stops focusing. That's the beauty of back button focus. So, single servo, it's going to find a, the, it, it locks on the subject and stays locked until you take your thumb off the button. Um, it's not going to track the subject. Once it turns green and it's locked, it's locked. If the subject moves, it's no longer in focus. And then there's manual focus. AF area mode, there's all these different AF area modes. Uh, for those of you coming from the DSLR, I would urge you to leave dynamic area autofocus. I know some people use it for some things still. Um, I don't, I don't use it at all anymore. It has none of the intelligent uh, power that this on the sensor focusing gives us like eye detection, head detection, torso detection, vehicle detection, animal detection, animal eye detection. The, the, the wide area, the, the um, wide area, all these different shapes of wide area autofocus do have that limited to the area you've selected. 3D tracking, you can select your subject and it's gonna look for its face, eyes, head, torso. Um, and auto area autofocus, it's gonna look for whatever the closest subject is that's got eyes, a face, a head, a torso, <coughs> headlights and a grill, whatever. Auto subject detection options. You can choose whether you want it to focus on people, animals, vehicles, airplanes, that's new with the Z8. That was just part of vehicle with the Z9. Auto takes those subjects in that order. It prioritizes people over animals over vehicles. 
Vibration reduction. <clears throat> I generally leave it all the time in normal, even when I'm shooting landscapes. These cameras are so smart, they know if they're moving. I have seen no image degradation, whether it's turned on or off, even with the long lens on a tripod. Um, sport mode, that's for if you're in a moving vehicle, jouncing along a dirt road, trying to photograph someone else in a moving vehicle. Um, it's really designed to amp up vibration reduction. I would not leave that turned on on the tripod. And I'd really only use it for that scenario I'm talking about, sort of the paparazzi scenario. Um, or if you have a tremor, you might try that and see if that's helping with, with some shake that you've got with your hands. Um, auto bracketing. So this, uh, <clears throat> you can choose what you're bracketing. You know, are you using just auto exposure or auto exposure and flash? Generally, I just use auto exposure. I don't know why I had it on flash. You can choose flash bracketing if you're shooting flash, but I just generally am bracketing exposure. Um, I like to shoot either three or five frames. Usually three is plenty, three stops apart. Remember, we have like 14, 15 stops of dynamic range now when we're in our base ISO. And shifting that a single stop does almost nothing. You wanna shift it three stops each direction. There's plenty of tonal overlap in that big broad range that three stops is not gonna look that different. You, you, I go three, I've been doing it for a long time since sensors weren't nearly as good as they are now and I get beautiful HDR results. I never use graduated filters. When I get into high contrast and I can't capture the highlights and shadows together, I generally shoot three frames, three stops apart. I look at the histograms. If I've got all the data I need, I just blend them in post. If there's not quite enough latitude with three frames, I shoot five frames. So I'm six stops under, three stops under on the meter, three stops over, six stops over, but almost always three frames does it. Um, and you gotta turn that back. Notice how all everything else was grayed out now. <laughs> um, I, I wanna turn that, if that's on, all kinds of things in your camera are gonna be grayed out and unavailable to you. Oops, I didn't turn it on. Uh, and this has a button on the top. Actually, we don't need to go into that setting. I could go here and say three, three frames. And now when I go back in my menu, you see how things are grayed out. People are always asking me, why are all my menu options grayed out? And I'm like, well, try turning your bracketing off and you just set it to zero frames. That bracketing button on the top does everything you need. You can change how many stops apart with the front dial. You can choose how many frames with the back dial while you're holding it down. It's pretty awesome. So we'll turn it off. Um, multiple exposure. Multiple exposures come a long ways in these cameras. You can actually see an overlay of the image you shot before. You can do, you know, say you want to take four frames. You can see a ghost of the first frame as you compose the second. A ghost of both frames as you compose the third. You can tell it you only want it to bring in parts of the image that are brighter than the original image. So that's nice for say, star trails. You can tell it that you want it to average all the images. You only want the darker parts of the image than the original image. It's really, really cool. And you can have it save all the raw files at the same time as it's creating this multiple exposure JPEG. I've seen it used in, in political images of public figures where their face is overlaid four times and it's really powerful stuff. I, I'm always like, hmm, I'll bet that was a Z9 when I see the, the tagline from the AP, such and such, four frame, in camera, multiple exposure. I'm like, ooh, cool. Um, HDR overlay, same kind of thing, an in camera JPEG HDR. I'd much rather do that with auto bracketing and have the control over blending those raw files in post. Interval timer shooting, this is how I do time lapse. I tell it I want to shoot 240 frames. I don't want them to be a minute apart. I'd rather have them be like, say, two seconds apart. And then you can say exposure smoothings if you have some auto exposure setting like auto ISO or, or aperture priority or shutter priority. Whether you wanna prioritize the interval, whether you wanna focus before each shot, I can't think of why you would. Um, you can have it build a little time-lapse video. Uh, I have it here building a 4K 8-bit time-lapse video and sending it to the SD card, pretty cool. Um, yeah, really, really robust interval timer shooting setup. Time-lapse video, that's an internal compressed video time-lapse mode, uh, it, it, you know, I don't ever use that. I use an interval shooting and create my own. But if you wanna go around and play with that, you can set the, the same sort of parameters and have it build a video and, and not store all the raw files. Focus shift shooting, that's focus stacking. This is some killer stuff. You, you're setting in a landscape scene and there's just a little too much close focus even with your wide angle lens and you want the mountain sharp and you want the grasses in the foreground sharp. Focus on the grasses in the foreground set your focus shift shooting, you can tell it you're up to 100 frames. Think of this number of shots as up to how many frames. Focus step width, I'd like to set at, say, eight, all right? 
that's for the landscape. It's going to make big jumps between focus. It's going to move the focus quite a bit. It's probably in the landscape, if you're focused on close grass and you set it at eight or nine for your focus step width, only going to take four or five frames before it hits infinity and stops. All right. <clears throat> you can set an interval between. I don't, I've never had any need for that. You can lock your exposure on the first frame. Say you're doing auto ISO. That's a good idea. Um, you can have it reset the focus position after it's done to where it was originally. Yeah, maybe, but in that situation where you're shooting the fly's eyeball and you go to the other end of the spectrum and you set it at two to do tiny little increments, it might take a thousand frames to get to infinity, but you don't want to shoot a thousand frames. You only want to get from one end of the fly's eyeball to the other. Well, you might tell it focus step wet step with the two, limit it to 100 frames and let it go. It takes the 100 frames, you hit play, look at the last frame, you're still focused there. You say, oh, there's a little more eye to go. Run it again. Take another 100 frames. Take a look. Oh, that got it all. Done. Move on. Um, so I don't, I don't generally have it reset the focus position because it's really handy if you run more than one um, for, for things that are truly close up. All right. And that's our whole photo shooting menu. So that means we have organized the photo shooting menu for how I like to set my camera up. You might be different for shooting bank A, our standard shooting bank, which we can then copy and build off of. Now let's, that shooting bank also works in the video recording menu and I'm gonna go really quick through this. Again, extended menu banks just save the mode, shutter speed, aperture, the folder, file naming, where it's going. I like to send it to the SD card, like I said earlier. What's your video file type? I'd say if you're just getting started with video, the 8-bit recording is pretty awesome and easy to work with. You can just do a H265 8-bit movie. If you're working in high contrast and you know what you're doing, you can go 10-bit. There's all this ProRes and NRAW and stuff like that. You can go look that up someplace else. You know, I would just use standard dynamic range again. If you get into Hyperlog Gamut or Nikon's log recording, I prefer night Hyperlog Gamut. You're going to have to apply a LUT to the end result and do a bunch of editing and post. Um, I shoot a lot 10-bit internal just because I can now with these cameras and I couldn't with the older cameras and it gives me more dynamic range. But I do have to work with it more in post-production. Frame rate, frame size is 3840 by 2160. That's 4K. I only shoot in 4K. I don't particularly need 8K. And I like 24 frames a second. So that's the setting right here. 4K, 24 frames a second. That's filmic looking to me. Video quality, I leave high. Image area, you can choose to crop to DX, and it still will shoot that beautiful 4K video if you want. Extended oversampling, I leave this on. What that says is take all the pixels of this big 8K sensor and sample them and then build me an even richer 4K video file from all that data. It's amazing. It can process all that and do that. I, unbelievable. At 10 bits, incredible. But it does, and it does a beautiful job. These are some of the finest video cameras you just can't believe it. Um, ISO sensitivity settings all the same as we have with stills. You can turn auto ISO on and off. It gets saved in here in the menu bank. Uh, white balance, picture control, again, flat or neutral. Flat's a choice of a lot of videographers for color grading. Neutral looks a little nicer straight out of the camera and doesn't need as much tweaking. Um, but if you're in really high contrast, go flat. It's gonna give you more latitude in post-production to grade that color. You can manage your picture control again. Hyperlog gamut quality if you're doing that log video, that's beyond our scope. Active D lighting, I leave that turned on normal. It just boosts shadow detail a little bit. High ISO norm, noise reduction, I leave on normal. These are all gonna be incorporated in your video file. Unlike your raw photos, this stuff matters. Vignette control, I think it's a good idea. Diffraction compensation, auto distortion control. If I were shooting fashion videos, maybe I'd play with these portrait and skin softening things. The video flicker reduction, I leave it turned on. If it's sensing flickering lights, well, it's a good thing to get rid of. This, you have to either turn on or off um, for the LED flicker. If you notice LED flicker, jump here into the video recording menu and play with high frequency flicker reduction. Same metering modes. Focusing mode adds one more full-time autofocus where without anybody touching anything, it just continuously is doing whatever autofocusing mode that you've told it to do. Like right now, the Z9 is filming me with eye detect autofocus and auto area autofocus and autofocus full time, and no one is standing directing it. Anywhere in the frame, it sees my face and eyes. It's keeping in focus at f1.8. Um, every now and then, it might glitch, not see my face for a second, but 
you know, we can live with it. And then your area mode and subject detection options. That stuff's all in the iMenu. Uh, in the video, I'll show you how to set up my video iMenu, just like the still iMenu. Vibration reduction, that's the same kind of vibration reduction, the in-body image stabilization. Electronic vibration reduction, yet another level. This actually crops into the sensor a little bit and then it kind of buffers jittery motion by, by moving the video around on the sensor. That's how GoPro does their magic. That's crazy, it can do it, it does it. Microphone sensitivity, I use an external mic and I leave the microphone sensitivity quite low. Um, that's just better quality. The Nikon amplifiers are not very good in the cameras. I'm not gonna mess with all these microphone settings. You can go in and look. Microphone, if you have a microphone that needs power, you can turn on the plug-in power. Headphone volume is nice for monitoring through the headphone jack. You can turn it up and down. I'm not gonna mess with time code or external recording. High-res zoom is a cool thing you can turn on, you can turn off. Um, it lets you zoom into the resolution of the sensor. Again, we're shooting with this big 8K sensor and if you're shooting 4K video, you can zoom from 8K to 4K and come back out from 4K to 8K. While you're still shooting at 4K, it's downsampling everything differentially. It's nutty. It looks smooth, looks like you have some professional zoom control mechanism working with your camera, but instead you're just zooming into the sensor. Um, it's pretty crazy stuff. But when you turn it on, it limits your autofocus capabilities. And to use it, you have to set up your custom controls a little bit in the video mode. I'll show you how to do all that. So I leave it turned off when I'm not using it and I put it in my My Menu. I'll show you how to do that too. So that's it, we're done. We've done our shooting menu bank A. That's all the settings contained there, both in the photo shooting menu and video recording menu. Let's go into custom settings. And the custom settings have their own bank. This is the last bank. Only the settings in this custom settings menu are stored in the custom settings bank. So we're gonna set up our standard settings, that knock around kind of mode. Um, and we'll start, you can jump into any part of this menu that you want. If you're interested in bracketing and flash, you can go to E. And into, <clears throat> but we're gonna start with A and we're gonna work our way down the list. These priority selections for autofocus continuous and autofocus single servo are for moving subjects and non-moving subjects. If I'm tracking a moving subject, it's important to me that right when I push the shutter is right the moment it takes. So I'm more interested in release than, than whether or not the image is in perfect focus. I wanna capture that decisive moment. If I'm in autofocus single servo, I'm usually in the landscape or still life, things aren't moving. And it's really important to me that what I'm focusing on is dead in focus. So I want it to not shoot unless it's focused. Focus tracking with lock on. This is that how long does it take to search for another subject after a subject momentarily goes behind a tree. Say a bird flies behind a tree and comes out the other side. How long does it stick with that distance trying to stay with that subject out the other side? And at a certain point, it starts looking for a new subject. So you can tweak with that, but I think the standard setting for steady and erratic is pretty good. Focus points used, you can limit yourself to half of the focus points, but I find the focus points move around this frame so fast, that's really not that useful. Store points by orientation. You can actually store not only where the focus point is in the frame, but what type of focus point it is. You could go from wide area to single point based on whether you're vertical or horizontal. Top left corner to top left corner, it can sort of stay fixed. Pretty cool stuff. I leave it just turned on to store the focus point. I don't need it to change the focus area mode. AF activation, this is one I suggest you turn off. That's how you go to back button autofocus. That's how you get focus off your shutter and more control in AFC mode. Um, I leave it on AF on only, not shutter and AF on. Again, you know, anytime you have a question about any of these menu settings, you can hit that little question mark icon up at the top right, and it'll tell you about it. If there's a question mark icon, it gives you some of the user manual built into the camera, which is cool. Focus point persistence. This is an interesting, you can turn it off or you can leave it on auto like I do. When we go into our action bank settings in the, in the action uh, bank, in the banks video that I do subsequent to this one, We'll talk about a way to do a hybrid autofocusing mode where we pick up the subject on the back button in wide area autofocus tracking mode that you know it's looking for eyes and faces and subjects and once you pick up the subject in that big box and it's got it locked, you can then hit a lens button or a function button on the body and boom, it hands it off to a 3D tracking point that moves all over the frame with the subject even if it's outside that box. Um, and the point persistence is whether or not it's willing to hand that locked on subject off from one autofocus area mode to another, and I leave that on auto. 
otherwise it won't work well. Limit autofocus area mode selection. I told you, I don't use dynamic area. I've turned them off there. Focus mode restrictions, I like all three focus modes. Focus point wraparound, that's if you go with the focus point off to the right side, there's a pop up on the left, off the top, it comes into the bottom. That drives me batty, some people love it. You can set it here. Focus point display, you can change a lot of settings, like do you see the focus point in manual focus mode? Uh, does it change color in dynamic area? Does it change color in autofocus continuous mode when it locks the subject? What do you, color do you want the 3D tracking focus point to be? I like white. <clears throat> Built-in AFSS illuminator, that's that green light that's so annoying in night shoots when somebody in the group has it turned on. I leave it turned on off unless I need it. And the only time I can think of needing it is like photographing people in a low lit event. Uh, otherwise I leave it turned off. Focus peaking. I love focus peaking. When you're manually focusing, you just see whether things are in focus. They, they get that little glittery edge to them. I think we all know focus peaking by this point. <coughs> I leave it at a sensitivity setting of two, sort of standard, and I like the color to be red. Focus point selection speed. This is set at normal, and I like it at high. It makes it move around the frame really fast. And when we do our custom control setups, I'll show you how I set the center of the joystick, the sub selector, pushing on that takes it right to the center, which is a quick shortcut. All right, manual focus ring in autofocus mode. Can that still be active? I like to be able to override autofocus with manual focus whenever I want, so I leave it on. Your ISO, now we're into metering exposure. ISO sensitivity step value. You can make it a stop or a third of a stop. I like the granularity of a third of a stop. Same thing with exposure stops and aperture and shutter speed. Um, so I go a third of a stop. You can go up to a full stop or a half stop. Easy exposure compensation. Do you need to hold the exposure compensation button down while you adjust it? I leave that uh, so that it's so that I have to hold the button down while I adjust it. I like that better. Uh, matrix metering face detection. Is the matrix metering mode of this camera and determining the proper exposure going to take into account a subject's face if it's a human? I think that's a good idea. I tend to like the effect. You can turn it on and off. You might blow out some highlights if you're in a deeply shadowed scene or if you're wanting to shoot someone silhouetted uh, and you're in an auto mode like auto ISO, it might really make it hard for you to shoot them pure black silhouette, so you might need to turn that off. It's a good thing to keep in mind. Center weighted area, that, I don't use center weighted metering hardly at all anymore. I think of it as kind of a legacy mode. There are people who love it. I leave it at standard, but I don't use it much. Fine tune optimal exposure. This is if you find yourself constantly adding, say, a third of a stop negative exposure compensation. So that's how you like the meter. You can make that the default. Keep exposure when f-stop changes. That's for variable aperture lenses, and you zoom and it changes aperture, and say you're in manual mode, is it gonna automatically tweak some settings to kind of keep you uh, the same exposure on the meter? I leave that off. I'd rather be in control of that myself. If I've got auto ISO on, it's gonna account for it, uh, which is in my handheld knock-around mode like I am right now. If I'm in the landscape and I'm set up on the tripod, I wanna be in total control of all those settings, so. I've got time to, to make uh, adjustments. Shutter release button auto exposure lock. Does it lock exposure when I half hold the shutter button down? Just like focus, I don't want it to lock exposure either. <clears throat> shutter buttons to take a picture, not to mess around with exposure lock and focus for me. Self timer, you know, how many frames, how long a delay till they start taking in, what's the timing between them? Uh, I'll show you how to put that in the my menu because that's often handy. Power off delay. I think the base settings that come with the camera are pretty good. I have it set right now to never shut down and I'm running it off this 20,000 milliamp anchor power delivery battery brick plugged into its USB-C port so that it's keeping the battery topped off um, because in doing this video, I don't want all this to be disappearing constantly for you. So continuous shooting speed. This is what we talked about in the beginning. I think you should set continuous high speed. I set continuous high speed to 20 frames a second, low speed to 10 frames a second. And when I want to shoot fast, usually I go low speed. 10 frames a second was mind-bendingly fast not that long ago. And you know, when I'm shooting my kids running around the yard, it's plenty fast. When I'm shooting an osprey striking a trout in the Willamette River out here when I'm kiteboarding, you know, okay, I want 20 frames a second because I'm gonna get the one with the wing position just right and the fish's head just right and the splash of water just right. It makes a difference there. 
but it's rare that you need that 20 frames a second. But I like having the ability to jump to one or the other, and I think of 10 as really fast. So I'm either single frame, 10 frames a second, 20 frames a second. Maximum shots per burst, I leave it at infinity. Pre-release capture options. This is this crazy thing you've heard about when you're in the capture 30, the C30, C60, C120 mode off the drive mode button up here on the top. Those are those JPEG-based, really high-speed capture modes. You can tell it if you turn pre-release burst on that I want to capture up to a second before I hit the shutter button. So you're holding the shutter half down. This is where the shutter half down makes some sense because it's involved with tripping the shutter. When you're holding it half down, it's actually recording those images. If you're at you know, 120 frames a second, it's recording 120 images over the top of each other until you actually press it and then it locks saves all those ones before, saves through you holding the button down, and saves for as long as you tell it to after you release the button. It's a pretty great way to capture the snake's tongue coming out of its mouth, um, the unexpected, you know. Um, so, you know, you, you shoot right when you see that, but you capture the second before you actually push the button. Pretty cool. Um, and you can set the post-release burst to be as long after as you want. It's all turned on or off with the pre-release thing, though, and off there, though. Sync release mode, that's for controlling multiple cameras with one. We'll skip that. Extended shutter speeds. This is another one I should have set up front. I turn this on. This gives you not just 30 seconds before it goes to the bulb mode and exposure setting for shutter speed. It lets you go all the way to 900 seconds. Now, it doesn't meter between 30 seconds and 900 seconds, so you have to kind of look at the meter and make some, some judgments. But it's so cool to be able to shoot a 15 minute exposure without even using a cable release or an app or anything. It's built into the camera. Limit selectable image area. I don't shoot square or 16 by nine in stills. I can crop to that and post if I want. Um, you, can, you can leave those on if you want. File number sequence. You can just have it, you know, I, I, I don't change that. I leave it on stock. Live view, this is important, the view mode in live view, do you see the effects of your settings on, uh, on exposure? So when you're looking at the back LCD or through this digital viewfinder, do you see the image brighter when it's overexposed, darker when it's underexposed, or does it keep it looking nice for you to compose? And I leave it show effects of settings. With one caveat, this camera, none of the Nikon Z cameras, will show you uh, depth of field stop down below f5.6 unless you push the depth of field preview button. And it, there's no way on earth to zoom in and do that at the same time, which is a complaint that I have that still remains unaddressed, sadly. But you can see F11 or F16 or F6.3 by pressing a depth of field preview button. I'll show you where to map that where I map it. Um, but you don't see it unless you push that button. It stops stopping down at F5.6 to preserve its autofocus accuracy, I think although I wish they'd let that go in manual focus mode, but. Starlight view, this is an insane mode that when you turn it on, on the tripod at night, you can see, if you've got a wide aperture lens, I swear you can see the horizon in a Milky Way scene and you can see the star field and compose. It's nuts, everybody who sees it from another camera brand, when I'm out shooting with my Z9 at night on workshops, is just like, oh my God, it's crazy, and so many people I know that love night shooting are excited about the Z8 just for that, along with warm display colors. Warm display colors have two modes. In mode one, it, it's just completely warm display, even when you're displaying the images. You can check focus and everything, but everything's gonna be red and not blow your night vision. In mode two, it's only um, the menu structure when you're actually looking through the viewfinder or composing the scene or looking at images. It's, uh, it, it's, it's normal, you see the color but uh, all the menus and everything else are in red. <laughs> I use mode one. We'll talk about that in the Astro bank setting in the next video. Um, we're getting there. I told you this would be a long video. LCD illumination. That's another thing about night shooting and in standby mode. Do the backlight stay on and do the LCD stay on? View all in continuous mode. I just leave that off. View all in continuous mode. This is whether or not you want an uninterrupted view of your scene as you're shooting in burst mode. Yes, for me, um, you can turn it off and get blackout if you want. Um, it's amazing there's no blackout. There's two separate feeds, one with images to the card, one with video to the viewfinder, and so you never see blackout. Release timing indicator. Um, so there's several ways to show that you're taking a picture if you're in silent mode. Type A uh, is blackout. 
I don't like that. Type B puts a little square that flashes around all the edges of the frame. I find it a little distracting. Type C is my favorite. It's got these little lines that flash on the sides to tell you, yes, you're taking a picture now. But the, view, the video never changes looking at the viewfinder. You never see a blackout at all. You just see these little lines flash on the sides as you shoot. Try it, I think you'll love it. Um, and this is for doing panning where you're tracking a subject with a slower shutter speed. Sometimes a little bit of blackout actually helps in that. It feels more like a traditional DSLR. And you can set it to switch to type A below a certain shutter speed. And I've been playing with that and I kind of agree with Nikon. If you hit the question mark, it'll explain to you. Uh, it aids in panning shots. Uh, I like their, their in-screen aids there. Uh, image frame, do you want to see a frame around whatever image you're shooting? Uh, I'd leave that turned off. Grid type, I like the three by three rule of thirds grid. It's nice, they give you a bunch of options. I like the three by three. Virtual horizon type, you got this newfangled cool airplane style, pilot style uh, overlay, or you have the old traditional DSLR style. I like type A. Uh, custom monitor shooting display. This is where you customize all the different displays the camera will show you as you cycle through on the back LCD. So for me, you can turn these on and off. I have four of them of the five selected. Um, in the first one, I just turn everything off for a nice clean view. I don't know why that wasn't, uh, why that wasn't included. <clears throat> Should have been. So it's a perfectly clean display. In the second one, I turn on the grid, I turn on the, uh, the level view, oops, the level view, and the um, histogram, and also the basic exposure data. Uh, and you can see how you do that. You go in here, the right click turns things on and off. And I also want to see whether the touch screen controls are turned on or off. Display three, I add in all the exposure data. Um, and you can go in, you got all of that. I just don't, I don't like the center indicator and center weighted metering indicator. I'll turn that on. So I'm going to turn on display three. Display four, I don't feel like I need another one. And then display five is always set to this just sort of information, your, what's going on in your eye menu and what your exposure settings are. It's kind of like having the top LCD on the back if your tripod's up high. Um, and so how does that work in practice? Well, I'm out here shooting. Right now I'm in my clean view. All I have is just basic exposure data and my focus point. If I hit the display button, suddenly I get to that display two with some exposure data and histogram. I go three, I got all that stuff then, and display four is sort of the top screen on the back with the eye menu included. And I can change settings in the eye menu. If I just touch it, suddenly that goes live and it's touch screen, boop. Okay, so, all right, oops. Hit the menu, go into the shooting display. <clears throat> the viewfinder display, really, really similar. Uh, one, I just have blank. Two, I have histogram, grid, um, and level view. I don't know why I keep having this center weighted area. I thought I'd turn that off at any rate. Um, display three gives me more exposure data. I don't have a display four. The viewfinder works great. High frames per second viewfinder display. I talked about this at the beginning. This is where you switch from 60 to 120 frames per second in the viewfinder. It eats a little more battery. It's worth it. Flash sync speed. One two hundredth of a second is the fastest you can do. That's what I said it at. I'm not going to go into a lot of depth about all these flash settings. If you're a big flash photographer, you know what most of these are. Um, bracketing, auto bracketing. I like to set uh, my auto bracketing to be shutter speed. It can be flash or shutter speed. All right. So when I when I go in to do bracketing for high contrast, if I'm shooting with a flash, I can bracket my flash shots. If I'm not, if I'm out without a flash on, like I'm in the landscape, it's automatically going to be shutter speed that's going to be interacting in my bracketing. You can set that however you want, but shutter speed is what I want. The bracketing order, trust me, stick with N. Um, I, I run into people all the time who have issues, and I had issues once years and years and years ago with a DSLR from Nikon when I started bracketing. That if you go with the shooting the first frame being underexposed, then on the meter, then overexposed, you actually need to set the camera to be underexposed to start with, or else the camera's gonna start where you are as the underexposed frame and then shoot way overexposed and then way, way overexposed. And you'll never get that underexposed shot. So just stick with their end mode, normal mode, let it shoot the frame on the meter, then the underexposed frames, and then the overexposed frame. It's just how it is. 
Uh, flash burst priority, we're not gonna mess with that. Customize the eye menu. This is a big heavy. So I've shown you my eye menu. This is how you customize it. You go in here, you click, you push OK or tap it on the touch screen and you get a whole list of things to choose from, right? There's a good jillion of them as I scroll down, you get the idea. So what I've got set on mine is the image area, metering, long exposure noise reduction, vibration reduction, silent mode, monitor viewfinder brightness, and then top front and center, the shooting menu bank that we're using, the custom setting bank that we're using. That's the quick and easiest way I can find yet quickly switch between both of those banks to set up a different mode like action from your standard knock around. Interval timer shooting, because I shoot a lot of time lapse, I can quickly get into that menu right here. Focus shift shooting, because I shoot a lot of focus stacked landscapes, I can get into that right here. And the autofocus mode, whether it's AFC, AFS, manual focus, and then your AF area mode, um, you know, whether, and, and Subject detection. It's really nice that it's on that menu because, you know, let's say we're in here and we hit the eye menu. I touch that 3D, the, the AF area mode. I can choose both. Oh, I'd rather shoot people in auto area mode or 3D tracking with automatic subject detection. Boom. Just that easy. All right. We'll go back in here. That's the customized eye menu. Now shooting controls. This is where we get that shooting control that lets us instantaneously flip from shooting in a landscape mode or knock around shooting mode into shooting action. Say you're out there, you're shooting architecture, you got a 30th of a second shutter speed, you're shooting in single point autofocus, and all of a sudden you see an eagle coming from the other direction. Well, with a traditional camera that's this complicated, it's gonna take you way too long to change all the settings to be able to capture that eagle. Well, that's not true because they gave this camera something that I don't think any smaller framed camera, including the D850 or the D500 had, which is a pro level uh, setting called recall shooting functions holding. You can map that to the function one button. We're changing custom controls on the camera here and you can see each button highlighted as I move them around, right? So that's the top function button, bottom function button, the grip function button. All right. so. I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna choose recall shooting functions hold. Recall shooting, shooting functions hold means you tap the button and those settings are set until you tap the button again to go back to where you were. Um, you don't have to hold it down. And I want shooting mode to be manual. I want shutter speed to be 1250th of a second. Aperture to be as wide as possible. Whatever lens you have. If you're shooting with an F4 lens, it's gonna get as close as it can to F4, F9.5. <clears throat> so that's wide open and no exposure compensation. The ISO sensitivities, I want auto ISO with my base as the floor. Um, metering, matrix, area mode, 3D tracking, AF subject detection options. You can change it. If you're always shooting wildlife, put it on animal. If it's people, should put people. If you're not sure, auto is a good way to go. Focus tracking with lock on, that's that. How, what's the interrupt? You can set that here, even just for the, for the recall shooting functions hold. And release mode, 20 frames per second. This is, uh, you could go 10 if you want, but why not set it to, to, this is that unexpected moment. Boom, you wanna be able to shoot action. And, and, and so you're set, boom. Now how does that work? Well, I'm gonna turn on all my exposure data right here. I'm at a hundredth of a second, right? Um, I'm in 3D, let's, let's change our autofocus area to say auto area, okay? and even make our shutter speed slower. All of a sudden I see the eagle, I touch, boom, look at that, 20 frames a second. We're in 3D tracking, 1250th of a second, boom, done, right? It's gonna activate auto area, auto, auto ISO if it's not, all right? Touch it again, we're back to where we were, ready to shoot the skyscraper, all right? That easy, boom. That's a super powerful feature and I would highly recommend you set it there. I put it uh, personally, on function one, because that's a button that's harder for me to hold while I shoot, while I'm doing something or rotating a dial with my other hand. Um, so I, I find function two button is easier to hold while I shoot, and I leave that for bracketing burst. So what that means is if I have exposure bracketing turned on and I hold that button down while I hit the shutter button, it's gonna take all the bracketed frames. All in one, one, one tap of the shutter button takes all the frames. It's just that fires the burst. Uh, I leave the function button on my accessory grip, AKA dual battery charger that also works with the power delivery battery brick in my camera bag while I'm shooting with the third battery. 
Um, I really only would use this for a long lens and to charge batteries in my bag while I'm shooting with the camera. Um, but I set its little single function button to be uh, exposure compensation. That's my choice. Autofocus on stays the same. Function three, that's where we set. Function three is the top left button on the back of the camera. And I set that to be the top of my menu. So that when I'm out shooting and I hit that button, boom, it doesn't matter what menu I was in before, it instantly takes me to the top of my menu, which has all the settings I want to be able to get to quickly. Um, super easy, boom. So the display, I just have it, I don't change. I change this sub selectors, the, the little joystick center press to be reset. And what that does is resets the center focus, the focus point to the center position. I showed you that earlier. I change the OK button to be zoom to one to one, 100%. And on the little grip, I set its um, joystick center press to be reset as well. Leave the AF on button alone. I changed the movie record button on the top next to the shutter, the little red button, to be depth of field preview. It's easy to reach over with my finger and tap and see what depth of field looks like at a given aperture beyond f5.6. And in still shooting mode, that red video record button is dead, except as a custom programmable button. So there you go. Uh, exposure compensation I leave alone, ISO I leave alone, the wheels I leave alone. I set both lens function buttons, just in case I've gotten into some other thing. This is another way to just quickly activate 3D tracking. No matter what mode I'm in, if I hit that lens function button, it switches me into 3D tracking and activates autofocus. So the way I do that is with AF area mode plus AF on, pressing that button, equals both changing the mode to what I choose, 3D tracking, and activating it at the same time. So I put that on both lens buttons. Why? Well, some lenses I have have two buttons, some lenses I have have one button. And when I have two buttons, the first button is way back where my hand doesn't tend to be on the zoom ring. It's easier access to that closer lens function two button. So I just set it for both buttons, it's handy. Um, my lens ring button, I like exposure compensation. You gotta be careful with that. Usually you have to reach back to get a hold of it towards the back of the lens, it's way back here on my 100 to 400. Um, but I like having exposure compensation back there, easy to dial with my, with my thumb without taking my fingers off the other part of the camera. Um, my uh, memory set button, I have save focus position. That's only really act, 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 uh, applicable for me with my 800 PF lens. And if your lens has another separate control ring beyond manual focus, I, I set that to be aperture, power aperture control. You can turn any of those off if you don't want them. Custom controls during playback. This is when you're playing your images back. Um, I, I leave my function buttons turned off. Uh, the display button cycles through different display modes. I have my function three button. That's the little protect button. I leave that to protect images. And sometimes I call that way. I'll go through and burst mode shooting and just mark the ones that are sharp and delete the rest. And it doesn't delete the protected images. Um, I have a whole video about that culling post Costa Rica. Um, so the OK button I have set to zoom into 100%, just like we were doing before. Um, and then I don't really change anything else. No. So again, you know, if I'm if I'm in playback mode and I go there, there's a photo of my son here in the studio, Pike, and I hit the center button, it's gonna zoom in on the focus point, and you can see eye detect was in effect. All right, so that's just consistency. Um, that does that, go back out of here. Control lock, that lets you lock shutter speed, aperture, focus point, if for some reason you're just set and you don't want anything changed, you can go into this menu setting and lock it all. Reverse dial rotation, if you're coming from Canon or some other brand where things feel different, you can customize your dials. You can, um, you can set it so that the buttons that you press, like exposure compensation, you can tap the button, change the setting, tap it again to, to turn it off. I don't do that, it messes me up, but some people love it. Reverse the metering, uh, light meter indicators in the, view, in the viewfinder and the monitor. Uh, I don't do that, but you could. Again, that's for continuity from some other brand probably. Reverse the ring for focus if it feels off to you. Um, focus ring rotation change. Um, you can change the control ring response. Um, to, make it, to make it a little more sensitive to movement or less sensitive to movement, I leave it at high. 
If you have a lens on here with a manual focus and control ring, you can switch their functions. I don't, I've never done that, but you could. Full frame playback flicks. So if you're in, in your review mode, you can change it so that flicking left and right changes the direction, it goes to the next image, sort of like you were on your phone. And up and down can do different things like adding star ratings or protecting an image or adding a voice memo. Kind of neat. Um, and you know you can see that in action here. I'm in the. I can flip to the next image just by swiping. Um, and back into my menu. Customize the i menu for video. I'm just going to go really fast. It's the same thing. You choose from a list. I have picture control, metering, vibration reduction. That electronic crazy vibration reduction. Um, the the frame size and frame rate. The image area. Shooting menu. Custom menu. Uh, the banks, those are the banks. Microphone sensitivity, headphone volume for listening in and monitoring your microphone. Uh, autofocus or manual focus, the focus mode, AFF, AFC, and what your auto area, autofocus area and subject detection choices are. Very similar. Custom controls, uh, I have that high res zoom set to be on function one and function two. If you'd set it for one, it sets it for both so that when you have that activated, Pressing those buttons zooms you into the resolution and out of the resolution. I don't change a whole lot else. Um, function three, again, to stay continuity, takes me to the top of my menu. Um, AF on, I think I do change the subselector center press. Well, I don't know why. I thought I'd change that, but I must not have, have locked it in. That should be reset. Uh, the OK button zooms into 100%. Video button shoots video now, <laughs> which kind of makes sense, right? Um, oh, this one too should be reset. So I'm showing you some sausage making behind the scenes here. All right. And I think that's it. Yep, I don't change. Oh, AF on. I put the lens function buttons to AF on. Same thing, the, the lens function ring I have set for focus. Uh, otherwise, oh, and I have power aperture. Um, for the for the control ring Control lock uh, Again video you can lock out those settings if you don't want them to change Limit your AF area mode selection. They don't have dynamic autofocus and video So I haven't turned those off focus mode restrictions. You I want all of them Autofocus speed you can make it focus change focus a little faster a little slower Say you're doing a focus pull you might want it to be slow fade from one subject to another focus subject and focus you might want it to be quick. So you can change those settings right here. Tracking sensitivity, same thing. If you lose your subject, how long until it goes hunting for a new one and how long until it sticks trying to look for it. The speed with which that high res zoom function is working is slow, medium, or fast. Um, fine ISO control for video, you can set it to be a sixth of a stop changes in ISO. Pretty cool. Um, and extended shutter speeds. I don't really use that in video. You don't go to 900 seconds, but you can go slower. I tend to use the 180 degree shutter rule. Um, that's a fun one to look up if you haven't heard about it. The view assist, you know, do I see blinkies when I'm blowing out highlights? Zebra pattern, also do I see zebra patterns? I like to set my tonal range for the highlights and have a pattern that starts at 250, 250, 250 in the RGB spectrum. Um, I don't limit that tonal range at all. I like the same 3x3 three three grid. Um, I like a waveform monitor for video shooting instead of a histogram. Uh, I don't, the large one could be handy maybe if you're really checking things from afar, but the small one works for me. Um, my custom monitor shooting display, uh, display one, display two, display three, display four. I don't know why these, I thought uh, these should be set. I thought I'd set these, I guess I haven't. So I want one that's just plain clean. Uh, I want one that simply has the um, touch to autofocus stuff, the horizon line, the waveform, and the grid. All right. Uh, and then I want one that has sort of the detail information. Um, there you go. That's it. That's all I need. I don't think I need display for. Just check it off. I press the OK button to turn it off. All right, same thing in the custom viewfinder. 
Display one should be pretty blank. Display two should just add that waveform to it. And um, display three should have all my information. Boom, very similar to my photo shooting mode. And the red record frame indicator, this I always turn on. This is awesome. You're shooting, uh, say we flip into video mode. I think you still see all my settings in video mode. It looks like it, yeah, because I have that set in the HDMI settings. And then if I hit record, I get that big, beautiful red box to show me, ooh, you're recording. That's great, it's a really nice feature. Okay, so um, we just recorded some blank video there. All right, so I'm gonna go in and say back to menu. We are done with custom settings, believe it or not. And that means that we are done with our banks and completely. We have set up the A standard bank for all the menus that it covers. Now we'll talk about some of these menus that aren't in the banks really quick. In the playback menu, I don't change a whole lot. You can go and delete files here um, and you can choose what folder you're looking at, images in on your memory card. Uh, in your playback display options, I do change that. I have it mark the first shot in a series of frames. If you're shooting a burst mode, it'll show you one, uh, it'll show you 10. It'll show a little symbol of a burst in 10. It'll show you this is the first shot in a burst. And you can use the little joystick sub-selector to skip to the next burst or go through each frame. Or if you use the, the normal selector, the, the OK pad, it's gonna go through each frame. I like the RGB histogram. You definitely want to look at your exposure data in each color channel. I like none, just having a straight up picture with no interference in it. Uh, and then I like to have all this shooting data. In, on there. I don't really need copyright data. I know it's there or location data, but all this stuff I like to have or even that. Well, no, that's handy. So there you go, enough. Um, delete pictures from both slots. If I delete a file, does it delete it off both? I, I think for those of you that shoot backup, it's probably a good idea, but it's your choice. Um, what is your primary slot for dual format recording the playback? Uh, it's gonna be the Compact Flash Express B slot since it's faster. You can filter the type of files you wanna see, only the protected files, whatever. Um, series playback, uh, the sub selector, that's that, that little joystick, what I was talking about earlier, displays the first shot. So you can, if you go left and right, you can just jump from the first frame in each burst to the next first frame in a burst to the next first frame in a burst and then up and down takes you through them or using the D-pad below. It's kind of handy, lets you skip through bursts really, really quickly. Uh, well, there were some other settings too, huh? I don't have the auto series playback on. Uh, that would automatically play every image in the burst after you see the first one. List the series as thumbnails, no. I just love that sub selector plays first shot though. Let me see, I think I have I have a burst on here. Let me go in here and look. If I go, there's a, this is a burst. Let's see, there's one right there. If we get to the first shot, it ought to show us that it's the first shot. There it is, 26 frames, all right? Now, if I go to the right, it takes me to the next burst, which was seven frames. If I go to the left, I go back to the beginning of that. If I start moving with the lower digital pad, it takes me through each frame in the burst. So that's a quick way to move through things. I like that. Picture review off, that, I leave that off. Some people like it, but that's where when you take a picture, it interrupts your shooting experience for a moment to show you the picture you just took. I really don't like that, particularly not in the viewfinder. You can say monitor only. Um, after delete, continue as before. I love this feature. I love when Nikon incorporated it. If I'm going backwards through my images from the first one I shot, deleting a few of them, when I hit delete, does it go to the picture I just looked at before to the right, or does it keep moving the direction I was going and go to the next picture to the left? I love that. I said it's continue as before. After a burst show, either the first picture in the burst or the last picture. I like the last picture. Usually one of the reasons for shooting a burst is that the first few frames are often blurry. Um, auto rotate pictures, I always leave this turned off. That way I get a bigger view of my vertical pictures. They're not rotated and scrunched to fit in the horizontal frame vertically. Um, I'm fine using my imagination to turn them to vertical, but I can see focus better. I can see composition better with them bigger. I can copy images from one card to another. Setup menu, you can format your memory card. Um, again, don't do that without loading your settings into the camera from the memory card first, and then save them to it again after. Uh, language, English, time zone and date. You know, I usually just connect my phone to SnapBridge to set my clock and my calendar and location data and stuff like that. It's a great app. Nikon's really improved it since it first launched. You just connect a smart device and bloop, 
First thing I do when I get on a trip is connect all my cameras to SnapBridge and it automatically updates the date and time zone and everything so they're all synced. Um, monitor brightness, you can adjust your monitor brightness and color balance. You have to be looking through the viewfinder to adjust viewfinder brightness and color balance. You can change whether you're in monitor only, automatic display switch, viewfinder only, just by pushing that button on the side of the prism. I get a ton of people asking me, my viewfinder's not working. Well, you, the button's been pressed and you're in monitor only. Um, Finder display size and live photo, I, I just leave it standard, not small. Um, limit monitor selection mode. Right now, because I'm running HDMI out to show you all these menus, I can't show you that, but you can limit it uh, so that it doesn't give you all the auto display, viewfinder only, monitor only, uh, prioritize viewfinder mode one and two. I like prioritize viewfinder mode one a lot, which just has you, it doesn't display anything except the menus and playback on the back LCD. You have to press menu or you have to press play. Otherwise, everything's in the viewfinder. I use that a lot to save battery and not use the back LCD. Um, auto rotate information display, turn that on. I can't really show you that taking video out via HDMI, but when you're in a shooting mode or when you're in the menus, you turn it vertical, everything flips and it stays right for you, unlike cameras of old. So literally even in the viewfinder, shutter speed and aperture and everything just moves around the frame and, and is right side up even though you've turned to vertical. It's pretty cool. AF fine tuning options. You know, this is something I did a lot in the days of the F glass. I don't do it hardly, I don't do it at all with the S glass. It's just so good and it's focusing off the, uh, off the sensor, so it's not like it's trying to coordinate the distance from the rangefinder autofocus system to the lens's motor. It's, it's just seeing what the lens sees on the sensor and focusing the lens to get it right. It works so well. You can do it though. Non-CPU lens data, you know, for example, if I wanted to use my old uh, 20 millimeter 1.8 manual focus lens, or 1.8 from, from yesteryear, all right? You know, an old AIS lens from the 80s, a manual focus lens that doesn't have any data sent to the camera. I just tell it that lens is lens number one. You can store a bunch of lenses in there, old lenses on the FTZ adapter if you want. Save focus position. This is an interesting one and I put it in my menu for one reason, that when you're doing, um, when you're doing you know, complicated landscape work, if you turn this on, and you turn the camera off and turn it back on, it's gonna come right back to where you were focused last. If you, uh, if you take the battery out, put it back in, it's gonna come right back to where you were focused last. If, however, you leave this turned off and you turn the camera off and turn it back on, it focuses automatically to infinity. That's the starting point. So for night work, sometimes you want it off as a starting point you can shoot Check your, check your focus, make sure it's right. Because this camera in pinpoint AFS will focus a bright star at night with a wide, it's amazing. You'll be blown away. You can not only, you can zoom in to 100%, find that bright star, put the, 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 the pinpoint autofocus point on it, hit autofocus and it'll lock green and you've got focus on stars. But it's also nice to just turn on the camera and have it focus at infinity. Auto temperature cutout, you can override it to let it get hotter than it might want to get when shooting really high end, maybe 8K ProRes video or something. Sensor shield behavior at power off, this is the one I told you about. You want the sensor shield to close and protect your sensor from getting dirty when you're changing lenses. You just do. If you want to clean it, switch this to sensor stays open. That's why I put it into my menu. Um, Clean image sensor, that's just vibrating to knock any dust off it before you clean it. I like to leave the automatic cleaning to clean it shut down. Every time I turn off the camera, it does a cleaning routine. Um, that's a good idea. You can create a dust off reference photo. I haven't done that yet. Pixel mapping, the camera looks for any dead pixels on its massive millions and millions of pixels. And then it, if it finds one, it will average that out so that instead of showing red or green or blue, it's gonna average the surrounding pixels to the same color. <clears throat> image comment, uh, this is to leave a verbal image comment and you can, you can, you can type it out or you can, you can attach a comment. Copyright information, I've entered my copyright, my chosen copyright information, it's as easy as typing it in. I put Hudson Henry All Rights Reserved, that's attached to every file. You can, you can uh, embed some, some IPTC metadata, I'm not gonna go too into that. Voice memo options, do you have to hold the button you've selected to do voice memo work down while you're, hold, while you're doing it, you know, whatever. Um, I don't really do voice menu memos, but there's your controls for it. Camera sounds, 
I leave my camera sounds turned off. Here's where you control them all. Um, I leave it off and it's dead silent. And you know, Stacy or someone else will pick up my camera to take a picture and say it's it's not shooting. And then I look and I'm like, you just took 25 photos. <laughs> they weren't seeing the little lines flash to the sides. Silent mode, that's another way to just make it silent. If you do like camera sounds and suddenly you find yourself around wildlife and you don't want to spook them, you can just hit this button. I, I put it in the, in the I menu um, just because it's, it, in case you had sounds on, it takes them all off. Touch controls, I love the touch screen. You can turn it off if you want. HDMI gives you some controls about what's going out via HDMI. Like right now, I have the shooting data going out so that you can see what I'm doing. Um, USB connectivity, priority, this is about whether you're tethering or whether you're uploading images. Uh, wireless remote control options, I'm not gonna go into that. That's for the Nikon dedicated wireless remote control. I, I have in my ATS links a whole series of accessories that I'd recommend for this camera. You can just go to hudsonhenry.com slash ATS links. And, and in that is included a Velo remote control that I really like. It's a radio frequency one. It's simpler than the Nikon one. It works great and it's way cheaper. This conformity marking is just, you know, like is the camera meets specs. Battery information tells you about the battery. You can see it stayed 100% charged even though we've been doing all this because I'm powering off the Anchor power delivery capable 20,000 milliamp battery bank that I also in my accessories section on the website. Um, USB power delivery on, obviously it's working. Uh, I don't know why you'd turn that off. Energy saving in photo mode, if you're running low on batteries or if you're trying to conserve batteries on a backpacking trip, I could see turning that on. I like to lock uh, the camera so it won't take a photo if there's no memory card in it. I don't, I've done that once with a camera where this wasn't set and I thought I was taking pictures, but I wasn't. Um, Save and load menu settings. That's where we save all of our settings once they're locked in. I'm gonna put this in my menu and show you how to use it right alongside the format memory card. They should be next to each other in your my menu so that you don't accidentally forget to do one with the other. But this is it. You go in, you save your menu settings, you go in, you load your menu settings. That's saving them to the memory card. Reset all settings. That goes back to factory defaults. Firmware version tells you the firmware version and if you have new firmware on your memory card, it'll give you the option to update it. You can also do that from SnapBridge when you're connected via, uh, via Bluetooth and Wi-Fi on your phone. All right, network menu. I'm not gonna go through a lot of this. Airplane mode saves power, you turn it on, uh, it stops trying to connect to the phone and that kind of thing. To connect to the smart device and set up uh, the SnapBridge app I've talked about, you go through this, this menu of connect to smart device and pair, ba 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 ba. Simple, easy to do, it really is easier than it used to be. I'm not gonna go through all this other stuff. This is more for like stringers and the AP moving stuff through Wi-Fi and you know. Then there's my menu. We're almost to the bottom of this. I, I told you it was a long video. I'm moving as fast as I can. So my menu, you can set this up. I'm gonna go into it, oops. Go into the my menu and all the way down at the bottom is where you organize it, all right? So we can set up tabs if we want to. Uh, but you can add and remove items. Right now I'm full up, so I can't add and remove. You can move them around with ranking items. You can remove items. I'm gonna remove one and I'll put it back. I'll remove delete so that we have a chance to show you how you set this up. Done, all right. Now if I wanna add an item, I go into which menu was that from? And delete's in the playback menu. So I go in there, it's the top item there. And then it says, where do you wanna put it? I'm gonna put it right under airplane mode. Or actually, I put it under save and load menu settings. Boom, done, bam. All right, so now if we go back up to the top, and I'm just gonna scroll off the bottom to get to the top. These are the things I have in my menu, and I have maxed out the number of things available. I put airplane mode at the very top. Why? Because I have that function three button in the top left corner of the camera set to go to the top level menu item in the my menu. If it's any of these options that have a little carrot off to the side with a sub menu, like format memory card, the minute you press the function three button, you go into the sub menu of that, of that item. And that's just something I wish Nikon hadn't done, but they did. So it's important to put something like high res zoom or airplane mode that has no sub menu at the very top. So that when you go into my menu from the function button, it takes you to the top of the my menu, not some subheading under the first item. Format memory card, all right? Before we do that, we load menu settings. Then we format the memory card, choose which one. Then we save the settings 
back onto that memory card. If you want to save settings on the SD card again, you can't have the CF Express card in the slot. By default, it saves to slot one. Take slot one out, it saves to slot two. Keep it on both. Delete, that's for that mode I was talking about where I mark the ones to protect and delete all the rest to cull and really a lot of action scenarios and burst modes. I'm only saving the sharp ones. Quick access to self timer settings, high res zoom to turn that on or off, that cool video mode, the zoom speed side by side, pre release capture options if I want to turn that on in say C30, C60, C120 mode. Focus peaking, set the fo change focus peaking settings. Sometimes I do manually focusing lenses. Connect to smart device. Focus tracking with lock on. That's that how, what's the interrupt on a, on a subject that's gone behind a tree. Warm display colors and starlight view. Sometimes when I'm shooting at night, I want to turn those on and off. So I have it really easy to access here. Save focus position, as I said, sometimes I want to turn that on and off. Flash control, when I'm working with flashes, I want to be able to get in there and control those settings. The picture control, I want easy access to that. You know, do I want to jump into monochrome in the middle of the day and shoot in black and white? Um, do I want to switch from flat to neutral? Power off delay. I put this in here because I'm constantly doing videos like this and I don't want to have to go diving through the menus to get to it to, to make them, you know, never time out on me. HDMI settings, again, because I do videos like this, I want to control what's going out via HDMI. My monitor brightness, sensor shield behavior at power down, that's just for cleaning my sensor. I turn it off, turn off the camera, take the lens off, blow off the sensor, put the lens back on, turn the camera on, turn it back on. And then that's it. That is it for all the settings. So remember, what we've done right now is we've set up the four, the four menus that have nothing to do with the banks. I've shown you how I set those up. We've set up a standard group of settings in our, oops, sorry, don't mean to be confusing. In our shooting menu banks, I've set up a standard settings, we're in A, and uh, we've gone through all the photo shooting menu, we've done the standard set of bet settings for that same shooting bank menu A and video recording, and then we've done the custom setting bank A, and so we've got our standard settings. I'm gonna jump in in a second video that you can click into this video's full description to find um, and I'll talk about how I just tweak these settings. These will be quick videos. They won't be nearly so long for action landscape and astro shooting scenarios. And hey, you know, I want to thank everyone for watching this. I hope you got something out of it. Um, I would say, you know, if you watch this and you're dreaming of me sending you the settings on a memory card or something or emailing you a copy, of my, my backed up settings. I, I just make a habit of not doing that. I think it's really important to watch the video and make your own decision about these settings and understand them. Uh, so I've seen people get into trouble more times than not when they download someone else's settings and try to apply them to their camera. It makes it so that it's not working according to the stock settings you'd find in the manual and maybe you don't understand why they're all set the way that they were. So it's just my, my standard policy is not to share those. Um, I want to thank you all for watching and you know I hope that if you enjoyed it you'll consider hitting uh, like or share, uh, subscribe to the channel, helps me out. And again, links to all the accessories and all the gear that I use and swear by as well as pretty cool custom tripods that I build that are just set for doing any kind of photography from long lens to macro and panorama. Uh, as well as the coolest backpacks, backpacks I think on the planet from Naya Evo, a European backpack maker, um, and case filters are all in my store. So just run over to HudsonHenry.com. You can always click this link right here. And that all those links and products help me out a ton. So hey, thanks everybody. I hope you're staying safe, hope you're staying creative, and I'll see you in the Banks B, C, and D videos, which again, will be much shorter.